and it is my distinct privilege to welcome our two luncheon speakers today. We'll start and introduce them one at a time. The first is my friend and classmate and fellow basketball player throughout uh, medical school, Ted Epperly. And Ted is sponsored by the Ogden Clinic, and we are grateful for that. And, he, and Ogden Clinic is also sponsoring Steve Miller, whom I'll introduce later. But I'm going to run through a little bit of, of Ted's uh, CV. But my privilege was to know him uh, back before he was rich and famous. So we played a lot of basketball together during medical school, enjoyed each other's company very much, and studied together. We were both whammy students up at the University of Idaho where we went back and forth between Moscow and Pullman, Washington. And Ted was actually our van driver. Now the van was a particularly interesting vehicle because it actually had some offensive capabilities. It turned out that the little sprayer that would clean off the windshield wasn't pointed at the windshield. It was pointed straight ahead and it would shoot out about 30 feet. So we would get up behind cars and Ed and Ted would hose down the car in front of us. As medical students, of course, kind of kids, we absolutely loved it and hunted down cars to spray. So that was, that was Ted. So Ted is currently a family physician in Boise where he's the president and a chief executive officer of the family medicine residency there. So it's awfully fun for me that both of us have ended up in the education of, of residents. He's clinical professor at the Department of Family Medicine, University of Washington School of Medicine, which was both, where we both went to medical school. He's the past board chair and past president of the American Academy of Family Physicians. And that bully pulpit gave him the opportunity to be very influential in uh, family medicine. Uh, he is also the author of a book that we will be learning more about and that he will be happy to sign for you at 1.30 out at the University of Utah bookstore area. He's currently serving as co-chair of the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative Center on Care for Delivery and Integration. There will be a test on that title later. And he is a board member of the ACGME. Retired as a colonel from the U.S. Army in 2001 and came back to Idaho where he was originally born. He earned his bachelor's degree at Utah State, graduating magna cum laude, and of course his medical degree, as I mentioned, at the University of Washington. He completed his family medicine residency at Madigan Army Center in Fort Lewis, Washington, and was also chief resident there. He is board certified widely published and given over 300 lectures both nationally and internationally and the book as mentioned is Fractured America's Broken Healthcare System and What We Must Do About It. I'm happy to introduce my friend Ted Epperly. Thank you Brian. It's great. Well hello everyone. It's a real honor to be with you. I cannot believe that Brian Campbell has that kind of memory, to remember almost every detail from back when we were medical students together from 1976 to 1980. Uh, I'm very honored to be asked by the Ogden Surgical and Medical Society to come and give this talk. I mean, all of us have lived through health care to this point in our careers, and all of us have our thoughts on the Affordable Care Act. Um, what I wanted to present is not a political talk. What I want to present is a policy talk in terms of what is it that we're trying to accomplish with health care reform in our country and why. And as has been witnessed, there's been good things about this, there have been some bad things about all of this, and there have been some really ugly things about all of this as well. And I just, as a disclaimer, want you to know that politically I would categorize myself as a centrist. Um, I voted equal numbers of times Republican for President of the United States as I have Democrat. I see myself as pretty much right in the middle. And so please understand that I'm coming at this not from a political viewpoint, but from a policy viewpoint. Uh, as Brian alluded, the reason that I got so interested in all of this 
is that I was the president of the American Academy of Family Physicians, uh, our 130,000 member organization, right at the time that the Affordable Care Act was being created. And because of that, I got to talk with President Obama and his administration six times, and I testified before Congress 18 times on provisions of the Affordable Care Act and trying to get this dialed in uh, to the United States. So with that, uh, I'm going to take about, oh, 35 or 40 minutes with you to review uh, kind of the big picture of what this tried to do. I know Stephen Miller is going to follow me and talk about Utah-specific things, uh, and then we'll take questions uh, after that. So first and foremost, as many of you know, we've got a lot of issues going on with health care in our country. We've got 50 million uninsured people. This is right at the time that the Affordable Care Act was being worked on. And just to put that in perspective, that's the size of an average European nation. It's 29 of our states combined in terms of population. And when you have the have and have not system of that many people without affordable, timely, and accessible health care, it leads to disparities of care in our country. We had the wrong focus. Ours is a disease care system. In fact, I would submit to you we have the world's best sick care system, but not necessarily the world's best health care system. And part of that is a systems issue. It's how we get paid. We get paid to do things to people, not to necessarily prevent things from happening to people. We've got the wrong delivery model, meaning that we are way undermanned with the number of primary care providers. And in fact, when you get outside of our country and you take a look at other countries in the industrialized nation that are doing better with their health care system than us, the uh, percent is about 50-50 in terms of those that are in primary care and those that are in subspecialty care. And it takes a balance. But in our country right now, as I talk with you, the percent is 70% in our subspecialties, 30% in primary care. And it leads to an inadequacy in terms of, again, places of usual source of care to go to. The shocking thing is that when you take a look at the last 12 years of medical school graduates from the US, 90% are going into the subspecialties, 10% into primary care. So at a time we're trying to balance the system to have more accessible care, we've got, if you will, the wrong team on the field. That's led to staggering costs, and I'll talk about that in a second, but I just want you to know that healthcare in our country represents the largest economic sector of the entire American economy. So it's a big system. But sadly, it's also the leading cause of bankruptcies amongst people in our communities, with about 1.5 million medical bankruptcies happening each year, or about one every 30 seconds. Because of all of this, too, we've got quality problems. Not for those who get care, we have wonderful examples of just outstanding care in this country, but as I mentioned earlier, when you mix in 50 million people that don't have timely access, it leads to a lot of disparities in care. So when you average that out and you look at the World Health Organization's ranking of countries, where the United States ranks is number 37th in the world. And when you take a look at who ranks number 36, it's Costa Rica. And I have nothing against Costa Rica, great nation, but I know that the United States has more to offer in terms of trying to coordinate a system that uh, is having problems being coordinated. And of course, we have a lot of issues with our health insurance system. It was one of the big things that was addressed with the Affordable Care Act, is to make sure that we put in place insurance rules that would stop the rescissions of care that would happen if somebody developed cancer or the denials of care for pre-existing conditions, or annual or lifetime caps that occurred. Now, I just want to share this slide with you quickly, because it kind of depicts what happens to 1,000 people over the course uh, of a year, uh, or excuse me, over the course of a month. And this has been published twice in the New England Journal of Medicine. But if you have 1,000 people, just consider you, for instance, 800 of those, or about 80%, will have some sort of symptoms in the course of a month. About 327 or so, a third of those will consider seeking medical care, 217 actually will, 65 to a complementary or alternative provider, 21 to a 
hospital outpatient clinic, 14 will receive some sort of home health care, 13 will go to the ER, 8 will be hospitalized, and 1 will be hospitalized at a quaternary medical center where there's a teaching activity going on. Now I ask you, where do you think the majority of the spend of America's healthcare dollars are when you look at that particular table? And you'd be right if you're thinking that it's in the lower three boxes here. And I would also ask you, where do you think the majority of medical and nursing education happens in our country? And you'd also be right to think that they're right here. We've created a perfect system in regards to both our education, our training, and the cost centers of where healthcare occurs in our country. And so a lot of what has been attempted to keep people healthy well as a nation really resides out here. So much of what the Affordable Care Act was all about, like it or not, was to help drive this curve, if you will, to the left, to stop the excessive spending that occurs here, because that's how payment works, and to help drive much more of the care into a community-based prevention and wellness mode as opposed to just downstream spending. So with that, I've come to recognize that what we've created in the United States is the world's best fire department. We're really good at putting out fires. The problem is, is putting out fires is unbelievably expensive. And in fact, that is the number that we spend on health care right now this year in the United States, $2.8 trillion. Now, when you take a look at that, as I'd mentioned a little bit earlier, this is the largest sector of the entire American economy. And what I recognized in doing a lot of advocacy work and trying to help the system issues of health care was that there were 2.8 trillion reasons not to change it either. It's been a very good source of income and jobs in our country. And I recognize that. I'm certainly a product of our system. But at what point and how do we start to balance then what we're trying to accomplish with a good health care system, but the cost of that system for America's citizens? And that became a particular challenge. Now, I just share this with you quickly in terms of the spending trends on health care. And many of you are probably aware of this. Back in 1935, we we're spending about 3.8% of the GDP on health care. In 2009, we're spending about 2000, uh, or 16%. Today, in 2014, it's at 18% of the GDP. But here's the shocking news. In 2025, that goes to 25% of all the spending in the entire American economy and to 50% in 2082. And part of that is the fact that we're an aging society. We have more chronic disease. In fact, many of us in this room are baby boomers or older. We have 10,000 people a day turning age 65 now in our country, and will so for the next 20 years. So as you can imagine, if we have a system that is very used to spending large amounts of money, especially on advanced procedures and advanced technology, how do we find the right answer, the right balance in that? So what I came to recognize with a fair amount of advocacy work, both in Washington, D.C. and at other places around the nation, is that there are two things that you don't want to see how they're made. One is sausage, and the other is a political bill, because it's really an ugly, messy process. So as you may remember, back in the 2009 time frame, the House, with its three committees, uh, uh, means and, and ways, uh, energy and commerce, labor and education worked on their House version of the bill, and they passed that on November 7, 2009, with a very tight vote, all political, by the way, and it was 1,900 pages in length. The Senate also passed its version of the bill with its two committees working on it, Senate Finance and 
uh, Senate Finance Committee and the House Edu or the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions uh, Committee. So we had two bills that were passed. This one on December 24th, much shorter. And then a really funny thing happened because all that needed to be done now, this football, if you had, uh, if you will, had been driven down to the one yard line. All it had needed to have done was a House and Senate Conference Committee come together and knit it together, and that was going to be the Affordable Care Act. But a very funny thing happened, and some of you may remember what happened, but it was the death of Senator Ted Kennedy. So with the death of one of the most ardent proponents of health care came an election in Massachusetts, the bluest of blue states, and Republican Senator Scott Brown got elected. And he ran to be the 41st vote against health care reform. So it left both the House and the Senate and the politics of this in a very funny position. Both bills had been passed. The House has to pa pass it by a majority, the Senate by a supermajority, meaning 60 of 100 votes. And so what ended up happening was a very arcane political wrangling in that uh, the House wanted to say on this bill, and so they used a mechanism that I've noted there called budget reconciliation which means that it can be the simple majority and the Senate can then pass that with a simple majority, not the supermajority, if it considers only changes to the bill that makes it less expensive. So with that, the House then passed their version of the bill because they had the majority of Democrats in the House and the Senate only needed 51 votes and passed that. So on March 23rd, 2010, the Affordable Care Act was born uh, in the United States. Now this was a big deal. Uh, it's the biggest piece of health care legislation since 1965 when Lyndon Johnson signed in both Medicare and Medicaid uh, into law. Uh, it was a massive overhaul of our health care system which will be felt in many ways for decades to come. Just as a trivia question to the audience, uh, any ideas on who this gentleman right here might have been? Here's Lyndon Johnson, Lady Bird Johnson here. This is Vice President Hubert Humphrey right there. Anybody know who this person was? He became Medicare patient number one, and that is Harry Truman. And the reason that he is there is that Lyndon Johnson went down to Independence, Missouri to the Harry Truman Presidential Library because Harry Truman had tried twice, unsuccessfully, 1945, 1948, to overhaul the healthcare system. Both times it failed. In fact, Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1935 had a major overhaul of healthcare reform as part of his Social Security Act, but there was so much pushback at the time that he abandoned that so that Social Security could get passed. So on his death in his fourth term, when Harry Truman became president, he took up health care reform. But twice again, the forces at play pushed back hard, and they were both thwarted. Hence, in 1965, when Medicare and Medicaid was passed, Lyndon Johnson goes down to Independence, Missouri, to have this bill signed in front of Harry Truman and made him Medicare patient number one. So. <clears throat> What is the Affordable Care Act all about? One thing you may or may not have heard about it, and this is why I think I was asked to do this talk, was what's really in this? It's a complex, massive piece of legislation, right at 1,000 pages in length, but simply broken down, there are six major components of the Affordable Care Act. One dealing with coverage, second with delivery and workforce reform, third on cost reform, fourth on health insurance reform, fifth on quality, and sixth on wellness and prevention. Now the Commonwealth Fund had already come out with a very important study that showed that two things and two things only start to drive health care reform for better health for citizens of, of any country if applied. And those two things were simply 
as many people covered by some sort of insurance policy as possible. Remember, we had 50 million people uninsured, roughly about 17% of our population. And the second thing that the Commonwealth Fund had found was that they needed a usual source of care. So you could start to integrate and coordinate that care in some sort of fashion so that you would have an advocate for each of the patients and their families within the context of their communities, helping sort out what was needed and what was not in regards to their health care. Now, this was built upon the existing U.S. health care system. All the committees of both the Senate and House did not want to burn down the existing health care system within the United States. That would have been a mess. They wanted to build those six pillars I just shared with you on top of that. Now, I'm tell you straight out, President Obama was a single payer guy. He wanted to just have the whole health care system be paid for, kind of a Medicare for all, but he backed off of that, and I think it was a wise choice. And the reason he backed away from that is that he would have never gotten buy-in from America. I mean, you saw the wrangling as it was, but there would have never been the buy-in from the insurance companies, from the American Medical Association, from the American Hospital Association, from everybody else, if that had been the course. And so he backed away from that, turned it over to each of the chambers of the House and Senate. They did their work, built that on top of the existing healthcare system as major reform efforts to lead to a more affordable, accessible, high-performing healthcare system. Now, let me dial into this a little bit. And many of you remember the film The Good, Bad, and the Ugly. 1966, a spaghetti western became a classic. I remember watching it. I've watched it multiple times. I love the movie. And of course, the good here is Clint Eastwood. Anybody remember the bad guy? Lee Van Cleef? How about the ugly guy? A guy named Eli Wallach. So this was back in the mid-60s. I recognize that some of you in this room may not have even been born then. But I'm going to use those three characters to kind of highlight, if you will, the features of the Affordable Care Act. So first, as I'd mentioned, the Commonwealth Fund had already shown two things and two things only start to drive a better health care system. One is some type of coverage for as many people as possible. And second, a usual source of care. So the first piece was about expanded coverage. It was intended to bring 32 million more people in, getting 94% of the American society up to some sort of insurance coverage. In there were some controversial pieces. The individual mandate that survived a Supreme Court uh, decision, five to four. The employer mandate, which for those companies less than 50, uh, they're exempt. Those from 50 to 100 pay a 2,000 penalty unless they're going to insure their people. $2,000 per head after the 30th employee, and those over 200 in size must purchase health care insurance for their people, although their employees can opt out and go onto the exchange if they want. Medicaid expansion, another controversial piece. And as you may remember, 26 states also in that same lawsuit heard at the Supreme Court sued the federal government to not expand Medicaid. Both Idaho and Utah were two of those states. In fact, Idaho was the first one to sign on to suing the federal government over Medicaid expansion. Health insurance exchanges were part of this, and you've seen kind of the rollout of that in terms of trying to provide opportunities for people within the states to have options for their insurance. Individual subsidies for those that made more than 133%, up to 400% of the federal poverty level to have the federal government in a sliding fee way help have some funds to help peoples and families afford their insurance. Co-ops, which are consumer-oriented and operated programs being available in every state that wanted one, and benefit plans and categories in which the provisions of a usual source of care, and the different categories of which there were 10 had to be part of all insurance plans. Primary care, wellness, basic mental health, obstetrical care, acute care, et cetera, we'll put in those. 
And of course, the categories were bronze for the cheapest, which covered 60% of healthcare costs, silver at 70%, gold at 80%, and 90% covered at the platinum level. Delivery workforce reform. You'd heard me allude to the fact that you know, we don't have the right team on the field in regards to not enough primary care people. Now, it takes a team to perform any sort of health care. We need all of the folks, but we just need to make sure that we have access points for all of the folks. It wouldn't be different than us giving health care to everybody in Ogden, and I'll just use a bus example. Let's just say we gave free bus passes to everybody or free high-speed rail passes, but we only had two buses to put them on. It's a problem, and Massachusetts found that out. 2006, that expanded health care to 97% of their population, but they didn't have enough primary care folks. So what did they see in the first couple years? They saw ERs get overrun. Everybody had a card, a lot of pinup demand, a lot of people that had put off getting health care. And so part of the plan was to help build out the primary care workforce, which is why I was so deeply engaged with this too, and why there was a delay of four years from 2010 to 2014 to start working on the delivery side of the equation to make sure we had enough places for people to go before the individual mandate kicked in in 2014 and then rolls that out through 2019. So it was an orchestrated, staged plan to try to get that right. Graduate medical education redistribution for unused slots to be slotted towards primary care, meaning family medicine, general internal medicine, general pediatrics, general surgery and psychiatry. Teaching health centers a new type of uh, animal that puts together community health centers and primary care residency programs. My program in Boise, Idaho is a teaching health center. We had a community health center and a family medicine residency. We put the two together be to become a teaching health center. Scholarships and loan repayments to start to then try to get the type of workforce that we're talking about, both in terms of scholarships on the front end, if you chose primary care or general surgery, loan repayment on the back end if you went into rural or underserved areas, and then this whole concept of the patient-centered medical home and integrated care so that the system the system properties would start to work together better. The third big pillar was on cost control. And you know, one of the messages that was really framed, that really, you know, I think confused everybody, was the exorbitant cost. True, it was $938 billion. That's a big price tag. But what was felt was that this is just going to add to the national deficit with no reduction in cost downstream. And the Congressional Budget Office had already done the math on this. The savings in terms of the projected cost spend was $128 billion in the first 10 years and over a trillion dollars in the second 10 years. As you start to get the system working together better, integration coordination, more upstream prevention and wellness care happening, starting to dial in on population health better, it starts to decrease downstream utilization. That was a very hard calculation to do. And so in the short term, it looks like a massively expensive bill. But you have to look not only in the short term, but at the long term in terms of what is the system fix that's trying to balance that. If you do the math, 10 years, 938 billion, that's $93.8 billion a year. You divide that into $2.8 trillion a year in terms of what it's costing us for healthcare right now, that's a 3.8% investment in trying to right size the largest sector of the entire American economy. In there, then, in terms of cost reductions, were two major areas one around Medicare and one around Medicaid. As many of you know, Medicare by far is the most costly part of healthcare in our nation mainly because it takes care of the older people that have the most chronic diseases. And so what tends to happen with health care tends to be reflected in what's done with Medicare. And so there were a bunch of provisions uh, put into the DNA of the Affordable Care Act to try to dial down Medicare costs in terms of Medicare Advantage plans that were about 14, 15% higher than other Medicare plans. 
creation of the Innovation Center to take a look at patient-centered medical homes and accountable care organizations. I think Intermountain Healthcare is a perfect example of what a vertically integrated healthcare system can be like and has received tremendous reviews nationally in terms of their coordination and integration of the system. If you will, it was to try to do what Intermountain Healthcare has done across the United States. So everybody has a place to go. Everybody's integrated and coordinated into the system, which again reduces cost. And when you get outside the United States and you take a look at that, that's exactly what the other countries have done. There's no magic formula that Spain or Portugal or France or England or New Zealand or Australia or Taiwan or Japan are using. They're using coverage for all their people and they're using primary care as the vehicle to develop that around an integrated and coordinated system that aligns payment with those services. So as you can imagine, trying to get that under control became a big deal. Readmissions and hospital acquired conditions, uh, many of you are aware of the fact that there are penalties applied, 1% withhold for each of those. If you have readmissions within 30 days, there's a penalty applied, or if you have hospital acquired conditions, a 1% penalty applied. Disproportionate share hospitalization, DISH, DSH reductions, so that as, as more people get covered, then hospitals would actually get less from both CMS for Medicare and Medicaid because more people have some degree of coverage. And so all of those were around both cost reductions and the same applied on the Medicaid side. Now a couple revenue sources that were in there. Medicare Part A hospital insurance tax, taxed to all of us from 1.45% to 2.35% in our tax withholdings on Medicare was a part of that. Excise task, tax on expensive insurance policies would be ta taxed. Uh, the annual pharmaceutical fees would be phased in from three to four billion dollars a year. Annual health insurance fees phased in over five years from eight to 14 billion dollars a year. Medical device tax, which would be an excise tax at 2.3% for expensive medical devices that the uh, companies that sold them would pay. And even indoor tanning services, 10% surcharge for all patients utilizing those services because they were known to be potentially harmful and harmful to people. On health insurance reform, guaranteed issue so that nobody could be denied. And I'm sure all of us have somebody in our family at some point that's been without health insurance and knows what that's like or has been like for them. High risk pools were created to bridge until the individual mandate kicked in for each state. Medical loss ratios so that large insurance companies, if they were spending more than 85 or uh, less than 85% of a dollar towards health care, whatever that delta was, they had to return to their premium holders at the end of the year, 80% was the medical loss ratio for smaller companies, so if less than 80% or 80 cents on the dollar are being spent on health care, the small insurance companies would have to return that as a rebate to their premium holders. Administrative simplification, so that finally we could try to get the hassle of the insurance industry under control with similar standards, same rules, same administrative electronic uh, uh, billings uh, so that we could stop the craziness of all the insurance forms and insurance market rules so that no longer is there rescissions if one of you develops cancer and you all of a sudden find yourself without insurance or denials of care based on pre-existing conditions if one of you has lupus and then tried as you change job to get an insurance policy or for annual or lifetime caps if you exceeded that. All of that stopped, as did the addition of people up to age 26 on their parents' health care plans. Quality reform, again, the fifth of those pillars. I don't think it would surprise you. We didn't have a quality strategy in our country, none. So what came into being really was embodied by the triple aim, better health, better health care, lower costs as being our quality strategy. Quality measures, part of that in terms of what was being monitored, what was being measured, so that you can start to performance improve those areas. Medical homes is a way to integrate and coordinate that care. 
different payment mechanisms around bundled payment. Community-based collaborative care network sadly did, got defunded by Congress, but it was a way to try to help almost like extension agents for farm services, help local farmers do a better job. That was to be applied to the primary care area, so le best lessons from an area could be applied to practices to help again in the integration and coordination of care. I think one theme that comes through is just the system needed to be tightened up. It was so loose. And in fact, in $2.8 trillion, the estimate was that a third of that was waste in terms of redundancy or reduplication of tests. It was that the system was leaky. And so a third of that, $2.8 trillion, $900 billion, was felt to be you know, at, at risk in terms of we can tighten that up and stop the loss of that kind of payment. Home demonstration programs for better community-based care. If you remember the ecology of care when we had the lowest cost centers be down in the lower right of that graph to drive that up to the upper left. And comparative effectiveness research. What's really working? What's the cost basis for that? And wellness and prevention. Again, a neglected part of the American healthcare system. So that indeed there was strategies put forth in terms of how do we start to coordinate better population health across the country. Now, what was not in the Affordable Care Act? And this became, I think, the bad. And that's meaningful tort reform. We had a moment in time to really start to straighten this up. We spent $128 billion, and that's probably a light estimate on defensive medicine in this country. But if we had better tort reform, we could start to really dial in to why we overorder, why there's a lot of redundancy uh, and duplication in the system. The Medicare sustainable growth, growth rate fix. That's an out of control formula. And we've been working on that one uh, for the last 14 years and have kicked that can down the road, I think now 17 times in terms of putting off a fix to that formula. And I would also say meaningful end of life discussions. 40% of all healthcare expenses happen in the last two years of a person's life and a third of that in the last single year of a person's life. So we needed to have meaningful end-of-life discussions, but sadly it got branded as you know, death panels and death squads, and it kind of died a quick death. But it's something that's really important, and I was glad to see the state of Utah in your SIM grant, the state innovation planning grant that Utah got, just like Idaho got one too, to transform our healthcare system, has as one of the, ma major, one of the four major provisions in the Utah plan, is to restore meaningful end-of-life discussions. And I think it's an important thing if we're going to try to get health care costs under control. And the ugly. Uh, again, Eli Wallach down here in the corner. Uh, but the rancor in Congress was unbelievable. And depending on what news channel you listen to, I mean, it was just nonstop in regards to how ugly this thing was. In fact, there's been 42 efforts to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. And I would submit to you, I wish we would have taken that time and energy and focused it on refining and refocusing and making it into a much better product for the good of the country instead of getting wound around the axle on the politics of this. And of course, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act was disastrous. It was botched. And you know, I. You know, in some way, any one of us that have ever put in an electronic medical record or a large overhaul of any complex system, there's always issues. So it's not too surprising to me that there would be major issues here. But at a time when you're trying to convince the United States that this is a good thing for the country, it was disastrous in regards to the rollout. So part of the, the ugly. Now, just a couple slides in closing. This is an important one. Why will the provisions of the Affordable Care Act move forward? And it's important to recognize that 80% of this, both parties agree on. I think we as a country agree on this. We've got to have a lower cost system, but at the same time, a better quality system. We want a higher value system. We want improved quality. We want to make sure the disparities in care are minimized. We want greater access for people to the right types of physicians at the right times for the right reasons and in the right places. 
and to have those people appropriately and timely moved on to subspecialty care and into hospitals or intensive care units when needed, as opposed to an out of control pinball machine where people can bounce around in the system with no integration or coordination of that care. Better prevention and wellness. None of us want to end up in an ER or hospital if we can help it. I don't, you know, I, I want to stay as healthy as possible. Now, when it's time for that to happen to me, I want to be in the right place at the right time, but I don't want it to be a default to a broken healthcare system where we have inadequate primary care. Patient-centered medical homes and accountable care organizations to start to integrate and coordinate that care product. And then the last bullet there, we can't afford not to. The thing that makes this so assured to me that we will make the changes is the fact that the financial cliff we're staring at in terms of the cost of all of this will sink our country. We cannot operate a country as great as the United States is if 50% of our gross domestic product is being sucked into the black hole of healthcare. It'd be like me giving you a 50 pound millstone around your neck and asking you to swim across a lake. You know, I don't care how good of a swimmer you are, you might get out there 5, 10, 20, 30 yards, maybe some of you might get 50, maybe 70 yards, but you're going down. And the same with our country in terms of the millstone of the healthcare costs. You know, Winston Churchill is one of my favorites, and he had a great quote about the United States. He said, America will always do the right thing after it tries every other option. <laughs> And so I think we're in this stage, this very funny stage right now of trying to do a lot of things to try to get this right. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm glad we're having the dialogue. The country's needed it in terms of understanding what the big deal is with all of this. So what to expect nationally? Most of the Affordable Care Act is here to stay. Just like Medicare and Medicaid, it was, it was despised for the first five years after its passage. But what bought America in to Medicare and Medicaid was the understanding from the people, the citizens of the United States, of what it started to do for their families. And I think we'll see something similar with the Affordable Care Act. We've gone through five years of a lot of stuff with this. But as it starts to kick in and as the positive benefits start to really be shown, I think we'll start to see a lot more people really embracing this. And in fact, the surveys and polls have shown that. We've had a progressive increase in people understanding, although it's still bad, and accepting the Affordable Care Act. And again, all of you have your feelings on that, and I respect those. Integration and coordination of care has to happen. This is a systems problem with the United States healthcare system. Cost reduction needs to happen. Quality of care, has to be what we're focusing on, not quantity of care. Fee-for-service has killed us in regards to trying to get that integrated and coordinated. More focus on health and less focus on health care. That's an important issue. And greater focus on primary care if we're trying to balance the system. So this triple aim concept I mentioned starts with the person in the center, that red bullseye, if you will. The patient-centered medical home starts to integrate and coordinate care around that person and their family in the context of the community. The patient-centered medical home neighborhood with our subspecialists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, hospitals, all of that integrated and coordinated for the good of the patient. And then lastly, the accountable care organization as a larger macro system integration and coordination leading to better health care, better health, and lower cost. So, I want to end, I think, two slides, three slides here. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, we go together. This is going to be a massive effort on the part of our country to work together towards something better for healthcare for those that follow us. As was mentioned, I learned a lot from this. I wrote a book because of it. But what I also recognized is that I was sick and tired of talking with politicians about it. Who I believed needed to understand this better was the American public. If the citizens of our country understood what it is we're trying to accomplish and why, 
I felt there would be better understanding and better buy-in. That's why I wrote it. And so I'll end with this. Sir Winston again. Dark days, World War II. You can imagine what London was like, wondering if they were going to be overtaken by the Nazis. And Winston Churchill gave the shortest speech in, in political history when he said to the people of his country, never, never, never give up. And I think for the good of the people of America, we should never give up on trying to do and help perform a better healthcare system for the good of the country. So with that, I really appreciate your attention. I'm sure I've provoked a lot of thoughts, and that's good. And I know that we've got to move on to Dr. Miller. He'll speak for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll take collective questions and answers. Thank you very much. Again, the opportunity to introduce a friend and colleague. Steve Miller is the current UMA president with whom I serve. Uh, he is a practicing otolaryngologist in Salt Lake, uh, specializing in pediatric and adult ear, nose, and throat surgery. He's been a member of the UMA for greater than 25 years, served as delegate for many years, and now is, as I mentioned, the president of the association. And he's doing a great job, especially as we look at remodeling the management system of the UMA board. And uh, it's an honor to work with him and to serve with him. He promised he won't be boring. I turn the time over to Steve. Thank you, Brian. And thank you all for inviting me to come up and speak. Um, it was a wonderful drive up this morning and I've heard about Ogden surgical and medical meetings um, going on for 20 some odd years with my partners. They've talked about it and have been coming up here and I, um, I'm grateful for this opportunity to come and speak before all of you and talk to you about um, things that you can do to help facilitate what Dr. Epperly was just talking about, um, which is bringing better, better health care to the American people. I mean, if we could summarize what he was trying to say and all those different slides, we really want to bring better health care to as many people as we can and hopefully every American person. So as we talk about what's going on in Utah, keep that in mind that um, our goal is as physicians, as healthcare providers and physician extenders, we have patients that look to us for our help. And we need to find a way to help them to do and feel better. Um, I like this quote from uh, New York bestselling Arthur Kevin Cruz. Life isn't about getting and having, it's about giving and being. And we as physicians need to think about how can we give to others and how can we advocate for our patients and be there for our patients. One of the things that you know, I'm currently the president of and, and Dr. Campbell mentioned to you that uh, he serves on the board with us is UMA membership is a, um, a great thing that you can be a part of. And one of the things that you will get is communication if you're a member, and if you're not a member also. And you'll also get representation on the, I can see why you're standing over there, that light kind of shines right in your eyes, um, uh, at Capitol Hill, up, up, up at uh, the state capitol building. There are publications that are sent to you, there'll be metabytes that are sent to you, but most importantly, I put the website on there. Please send us your email. If, if you're not a member, uh, we still want your email and we'd love to send you information, especially when it comes to bills that are happening up at the legislature. I'll tell you uh, just a quick story. Um, there was, um, I was in a committee and I was going to testify before a committee and we were, were three physicians of our physician legislatures who were on that committee, uh, Representative Barlow, Red, and Kennedy. 
fellow physicians that you may know. They, as I was talking to them about this bill that was going to be talked about the next day, one of them said to me, do doctors really care about this? Do they really want to have this agreement? Do they really want to oversee um, what goes on here? And I said, yeah, they want to know and they want to, to oversee them. And he says, well, but you're the only one that's telling me this. How come others aren't telling me? Um, so we sent out an email that night and the next morning that doctor came to me and said, I don't know what you did, Steve, but I got barraged with emails from physicians. And so we need your help on a last minute basis and on a continual basis. So send us your email, see Sylvia, she's at the UMA booth right around the corner and get, become a member. Both those things would be great. The next thing to get involved is um, let's get involved nationally. We have four uh, congressmen and two senators. I have called this grassroots hotline. They'll ask you if you want to talk to your senator or they'll want, ask you if you want to talk to your congressman. You'll get one of them. Uh, you won't get them, but you'll get one of their staff members and they'll ask you, what do you want to talk about? Which bill do you care about? And how, 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 how do you feel about it? And then that will be tallied up for them to, to vote on it. Well, in March, I was able to go to the advocacy meeting back in uh, Washington, D.C. with several other UMA members. And these were some of the issues we talked about with all four of our congressmen and both senators. And I'll tell you that the Utah Medical Association gets an audience with all of them. There are many uh, organizations that may get a staff member, but we got an audience with every one of them. We have a great relationship with them. Medicare Empowerment Act is one you may want to weigh in on. Um, that act is the House bill and Senate bills right there. It allows both patients and physicians to opt in and opt out of Medicare, not just on a yearly basis, which is what the current rule is, but as often as you'd like to. So if you have a patient who wants to see a physician and doesn't want to go through Medicare, they can do it and then still go back to Medicare. If you have a physician who needs to opt out so they can see a patient and do something, they can do that and then come back. It just frees up the healthcare system. So when we talk to the congressmen and senators about this, before we came back to Salt Lake, Two of them signed on as co-sponsors of that bill. Both uh, Congressman Bishop and Stewart have signed on. The other two congressmen have not. So those of you who may have those congressmen or senators, you may want to call them and say, hey, what about this? That's, I, I'm for this. ICD-10 repeal. We talked to them about that. As you know, ICD-11s, well, as you may not know, ICD-10 has been repealed for ten, another year. However, ICD-11 is due to come in 2017. ICD-11 is a lot fewer codes than ICD-10. It's a lot smaller change, and you will be making the change to 10 first in a year, and then to 11. There is a bill out there that repeals that and tells them just to wait for 11. GME funding, we don't have enough residency spots for the students that we're, we're finishing. We wanna push them on that, and then SGR repeal, which was already discussed, um, which essentially needs to be taken care of. And Senator Hatch told me, who sits on the Senate Finance Committee, I have a plan, it will be taken care of, just give me some time. He thought it would be taken care of in March, but it got kicked down the road, but he's still working on it. The next thing to get involved with is more of a local thing that you need to really think about. As you heard, we need to define quality and value. Nobody knows what is quality and what is value. We need to define it for your clinic, for your office, for this state, for your community. If you don't define it, who's gonna define it? Um, whichever administrator or nurse that might get paid to do it. Not that that's um, gonna be bad, but it's, I hear physicians come to me and say, how is this quality? I mean, it doesn't change that we, we're not going to improve what we're doing for patients by, the, by doing this. I mean, all they're doing is keeping track of how long they're waiting in my waiting room. Well, if that's not quality, what is? And you guys need to be part of those committees and help make that decision. Um, 
just so you know, this is part of the Utah health care reform, that Medicaid accountable care organizations are being formed and they don't know what quality is. Quality is not yet defined, but their goal is to pay for quality. And we, you need to be on those committees if you want to have a voice in what quality is. So make sure you're a part of that. Um, and um, there is a task force that you could testify before who's working on the Accountable Care Organ uh, Act implementation. So please be a part of it. Don't sit back and think that I'm just going to see patients and I'm going to do the, the thing I know best. And um, if I do that, that's all I care about because it will come to affect how you're seeing patients if you don't get involved. Another thing that has come up to me in a couple different things, there are many walks of life for physicians that are employed, not employed, part of clinic groups, uh, um, on their own. Those people who are on their own t t tend to be involved in their billing practices. Many people tend to just let the corporation or their billing service or whatever bill for them. Remember, you are responsible for Medicare fraud, not whoever's billing for you. Um, appropriate quoting needs to happen. If you are involved in the billing services, you'll know what costs of supplies will be there and you'll actually be able to bring value to the discussion. So make sure you get involved in the billing practices that are done for you and know what's going on. You'll also know <clears throat> who's being sent to collections and maybe who's getting bankrupted, as he mentioned, um, Dr. Eppley mentioned, many people are being bankrupted. Um, not because the physician knew about it, but because of billing um, practices. So be sure and know what's going on. The next thing you need to get involved in is in your office management. Know your, manager, your office manager or your administrator. They represent you on the phone, they're talking to patients, they're talking to insurance companies. You need to know and trust them. And um, there are many of us who tend to just say, well, that's their job, and I'm just going to come to work every day and not know what's going on. I'm going to let them interview the new employees who work in my front office, my MA, my nurse, and then they're going to, and then they'll bring them to me, and, and that'll be great. The problem is, once you get rid of that, all of a sudden you have somebody that you may not trust uh, working for you. I'll tell you a story about um, a primary care physician friend of mine who I asked, well, how's it going in your practice? Um, she's currently employed. She's currently um, a mother of two and busy with a lot of things. And she said to me, well, how much time do you have? And I said, well, what do you mean? She goes, well, um, first, I'm not happy because um, they've decided that a medical assistant is good enough for me and I don't need a nurse, you know, but I have complex problems for my patients. I need, them to, I need the nurse to be counseling on diabetes and um, on nutrition and all sorts of things. And the medical assistant, bless her heart, she's only had six months of training and she's just not up to doing all the things I need. And if I had a nurse, I would be much more productive and better able to take care of my patients. And I said, well, do you get to interview uh, who, who is your nurse or who your MA is? And she says, no, I really don't get to do that. And then I said, well, um, what's going on with your MA now? And she goes, well, my MA quit in October, and I've had a different MA every day for the last three months. They're finally getting me a new MA, and I just went to her graduation, and so I'm teaching her what to do. But for three months, every day, I was teaching the MA what to do. And because I was doing that, my productivity went down, and guess what? The administrator or manager came to me and said, why is your productivity down? You need to be seeing more patients. And she said, well, you, you gave me this MA, and every day I got a new MA, and I couldn't, I couldn't get as much done because I was teaching her. So the bottom line is we need to be involved. We need to step up and say we can interview. I had a discussion with... Um, one of the healthcare systems this morning, and I said, your employed physicians, can they 
actually be a pro in the process of interviewing their employees? And they said, yes, but most of them don't want to. And I said, well, I'm going to start talking to them today and say, make sure you're, if you're not doing it, it's your own fault because you need to find the right person for the job. Um, oh, I went back. I apologize. I like this quote from Steve Jobs. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. That physician who is an internist is not happy. She doesn't love what she's doing right now. Many of us went into medicine for a reason, because we love it, but when we get lost in the, Afford in the Accountable Care Act, we get lost in the uh, business of corporate medicine, we lose sight of what we love to do. The great work is done between you and the patient. Take the time to make sure that you are um, doing what you need to do so that you can do great work and that you love it because that's how we're gonna be able to get things done. The next thing is community caucuses. Um, community caucuses, there is many things going on in your community and physicians are looked up to as leaders. I went to my first neighborhood caucus meeting in March. I'm sad to say I didn't go before because it was interesting. There was only five or six of us there. Um, they said, oh, why don't you be the state delegate? Why don't you be the county delegate? Um, the county delegates choose the, the candidates that you know, run for the county offices and the state delegates choose the, the congressmen and the other candidates. And I just found out that, gosh, you know, we really need to be a part of this because there's been many times that I've said, my parents have said, how can we have two lousy candidates? You know, can't we have better candidates to choose from? And it's, and um, the bottom line was they're chosen in March and May, and if we're not involved in choosing that in that process, we deserve what we get when it comes election time. So take the time to know them, and if you become a county delegate or state delegate, the legislators up at uh, our Capitol Hill will listen to you more, and you'll be able to help us to uh, negotiate better. Um, there was a couple of bills that uh, went through, and I won't read all these details. You're welcome to. But uh, uh, the, the Utah Medical Association were co-sponsors or sponsors on both of these bills, and um, they uh, went through without a problem because uh, the UMA does have some good clout. The first one is basically a truth in advertising bill, which just basically means everybody should wear a badge. We shouldn't be, a patient should not be deceived by seeing a doctor of something else besides a physician uh, and credentials should be there. Um, and that's going to happen. And then the pharmaceutical dispensing bill, we, uh, Senator Vickers is a pharmacist and he just wanted to make sure that, that doctors could dispense in their office if they follow the rules. And basically it just sets up um, that to start happening if you would like to dispense. Um, so, um, Amelia Earhart says, the most difficult thing is the decision to act. The re rest is merely tenacity. And that goes right with uh, your quote about never, never give up. We really need to just get in and keep uh, fighting and decide to act for our patients, for ourselves, for our practices. Another way to get involved is to pay uh, Utah Medical PAC dues or American Medical PAC dues. That money does help us to have clout with our congressmen, with our legislators. Uh, we use that um, to help them with their campaigns. Um, you could also pay your PAC dues out there with Sylvia. Um, and we would love to have you be a part of that also. The last thing I wanna uh, mention before I summarize is, it is my belief, and I think it's the belief of many who set up the Affordable Care Act that physician-led health care is very important. And that does not mean that non-physicians aren't important. Everybody's important in our health care plan. We need everybody to take care of all these millions of people. We need PAs, nurse practitioners, nurses, community uh, centers, et cetera. We need them all. And that's the best way that we're going to be able to take care of the needs of the American public. 
but we need to set up physician-led health care. We need places for those people to go to physicians to ask the hard questions, to get the help they need, not to manage their blood pressure or whatever, the, the, all the easy things, but to manage the hard things, okay? But if they have a hard question, they need some backup. Physicians have a lot of training. You all know that. The training needs to be put to work to lead others. Um, one way you can improve your leadership skill, and you could register for the UMA leadership training. The first one's going to happen to the, in the fall of 2014. We, re, we have received a leadership grant to do uh, multiple leadership trainings, and it's going to be fall and spring. Um, and they're going to be in conjunction with uh, the University of Utah. They're going to pull in some business expertise. It's going to be physician directed. You should get involved in becoming a physician leader in your community and in your clinics. Mark Twain says, 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than by the ones you did do. So throw off the bowline, sail away to a safe, sail away from safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, and discover. Change is here. We've got to change. We've got to figure out uh, a better way of doing things. Do, as Mark Twain says, don't try and just live in the, uh, in the past. Go out, make something happen, get involved with your community, um, and get involved with other uh, physician extenders to make a better um, health care system, um, both here in Ogden, here in Utah, and in the United States and throughout the world. I appreciate, again, the opportunity to speak to you and um, we'll be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much. We'll ask you to go to the microphones, if you would, please, for questions. Uh, for those of you that live in Weber County, there is a Weber County uh, Medical Society delegate training to the UMA House of Delegates, and that will be on July 9th at 6.30 at Ogden Regional. So I will uh, ask for questions, and I'll turn this mic over to Ted. Go ahead, please. This is a question for Dr. Epperly. <clears throat> Someone said that life is too short to make all of your own mistakes. Uh, we heard last night, I think, that some of the countries that enjoy a ranking above the 37th place of the United States are having problems of their own in, in dicking out uh, with current financial problems in those existing systems as good as they appear to be. What are some of the lessons that we could learn from them and avoid some of the mistakes that they're making as we um, engage in this uh, refining and, and further improvement of, of the system that we're going to be dealing with? Okay, excellent question. Um, first, in those countries, uh, they also uh, struggle in the sense of trying to get this thing dialed in. Uh, and it leads me to tell you that there, and I've done quite a bit of work on other countries' uh, healthcare systems, there is no perfect healthcare system out there. Uh, and in fact, it's led to this grass is greener on the other side of the fence approach that many countries have. They're looking at other systems, seeing what works, so it's perfectly in alignment with what you said. One of the other truisms I've found with this is that uh, doctors and hospitals uh, never think they're making enough money. Uh, and that has been a truism across all the countries as well. So not unique just to us. The last of the three truisms that I've found from studying you know, other countries' healthcare systems is the last reform measure is viewed pretty much by most people as having failed. <laughs> so uh, that, uh, I think, is a great reminder to us that all the countries uh, are in this performance improvement phase of trying to get this dialed in. With that said, to your question now specifically, I think some of the lessons learned that will really be helpful to the United States is number one, understanding the value of coverage so that as many people as possible, again, having some degree of coverage. The reason for that is that it leads to a lot of security in their minds about knowing that they don't need to live sicker and die younger because they can't afford health care. 
and put off a lot of problems, and then when they get to extremis, they show up in an emergency room or into the hospital on fire, like the one slide is. So uh, again, the understanding of basic coverage to as many people as possible uh, has held up over time. The second, uh, and I alluded to this too, and I'll stop with this, is again the importance of a usual source of care. Uh, the reason for that, and Stephen referred to this too, is the importance of relationships. If you have a relationship with someone you know and you trust, that is everything in regards to helping sort out questions and issues around your health care. And we need to put the patients really back into the center of this. It is and should be about them and their choices. And we should have that kind of relationship so we can help dial into that. Now, having said that, I'll uh, just add one other thought, and that is that we need to incentivize our patients across this country to be engaged as well with this transformation effort. Uh, I have patients that can out eat or out drink any medication I'll ever put them on, and they've got to be part of the solution too. And so dialing into behavior change and helping incentivize that is important, but it won't happen if there's not a relationship with them. This microphone, please. Yes, yeah, so would you mind putting that slide back up, the last quote by Mark Twain? It was pretty cool, just for a minute. I have a question. Um, I was very excited about the Affordable Health Care Act, thinking that I can get all my patients that have not had colonoscopies and mammograms. And now that I find out that they have these extraordinary um, deductibles, they still don't want to have their colonoscopy because they have a $7,000 deductible. And then I have some patients that simply have not signed up because it's too expensive. So to me, this is kind of an oxymoron, Affordable Care Act, but my patients can't afford it. Yeah, uh, understand. Good question. Yeah. One of the provisions in the Affordable Care Act was to make all preventive services have no copays nor deductibles. So if it met uh, category B, United States Preventive Services Task Force, criteria for evidence in terms of strength of recommendation, B or higher, B or A rating, then there is no copay, no deductible for that preventive service. So uh, in regards to the colonoscopy patient, um, you know, screening colonoscopy uh, is uh, felt to be a category B provision. I don't know about the uniqueness of your particular patient if there was uh, some sort of, uh, you know, uh, a polyp removed or some sort of electrocautery applied uh, that would make it so expensive. But it does lead to one other point, and that is that there are a lot of procedures that are unbelievably overpriced. And when the RUC, which is the Relative Value Update Committee, priced colonoscopy, and I'll just use it as an example, they used it when the technology was less and it took longer. Liability issues f factor into that, and there has been a tremendous improvement in both technology and time. The healthcare sector is the only sector in our economy where new technology increases prices and not decreases prices. So we've got a lot of work to do in terms of trying to dial that down, uh, in terms of trying to right size what a cost of a colonoscopy is. If you get outside the United States, no country charges the prices the United States does for a colonoscopy. And that can range anywhere from $75 for a colonoscopy to about $700 for a colonoscopy. And you know, I'm not sure what all is being charged here in Ogden, but I can tell you in Boise, Idaho, I've seen patients pay upwards to $5,000 for a colonoscopy. And that has to stop. You know, what happened with his colonoscopy, he's went in, you know, if you go in for a screening, it's a screening, they'll cover it. But if they go in there and they find a polyp, they pop, pop the polyp up and it's no longer, di it's a diagnostic. So it doubles the cost mm -hmm. and the patient has to pay for it now. Right. So, I mean, who makes up these rules is what I want to know. Yeah. You know, yeah. it doesn't make sense. I mean, you don't sure. know that when you go in there yeah. that you're going to have polyps. And a third of my patients have polyps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear that. And I, I, and again, it leads to a point that, there's work to be done on this. Um, it, it's clearly not by any means perfect. And that's why I say the, the refinement and refocusing on this, 
I, I think it'll take 20 years to really dial this in. And there's going to be, there's stuff like that out there that's, that isn't ideal and that we do need to change. Frank? Yeah, Ted, I just wonder, um, I, I have lived overseas. My son's over in grad school in Switzerland right now getting really excellent medical care in that system. And I have old roommates from high school days in Austria that are physicians that are part of the system in Vienna and small towns along the Danube, and they, they do very well. And, um, but I, I think there's really a major difference between the American psych and the European psych in terms of their uh, perspective on medicine and, and basically kind of to summarize it, 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 we're just ravenous consumers of whatever we is put in front of us. Uh, whether it's new cars, houses, food, <laughs> obesity. Um, I don't think you can compare America to, to Germany or, or there, there's hardly any overweight people in Switzerland. You walk around, there's nobody with a BMI of 35. I mean, you, so, so I think the psych uh, in, in terms of the expectation, the sense that there's some finite to the systems and so forth over there, Obviously, they all have skin in the game. They're, play, they're paying high taxes. I, I, I struggle with this. I, I think we need to cover for people, but I don't think we can do that in America, certainly with the current psych and the current system the way it is. And I just wonder if you have some insight into that. Yeah, I, I do, and maybe Steve can add to this too. The, uh, um, you're absolutely right, Frank. You know, part of the issue is the American psyche. Uh, uh, our expectations, uh, many uh, of us, are that everything should be done and we should have uh, everything we want. I mean, it, it, it fits into both how the United States runs but also what our expectations are uh, of our country. And I do believe that there needs to be a culture change in regards to several things. Uh, first is the fundamental question is healthcare a basic right? And if I were to ask a show of hands on how many of you think it's a basic right and how many people don't, I would almost predict the group will be almost 50% on each. That's kind of what America is at with this. So one thing that is true about our country is we've not resolved the basic issue of is basic health care a right that all citizens in our country should have. One of the things that the industrialized countries outside the United States have decided, and I'm not trying to say it's right nor wrong, but they have a solidarity around the fact that basic health care is a right of every citizen in those countries. And with that basic question resolved, they've been able to then help design their health care systems around that. And that's something we fundamentally still struggle with in our country. I just emphasize what you already said about end of life care and the need to answer the tough questions, um, which is also changing that psyche that grandma or mom or dad needs everything done because that's just where all the health care dollars end up uh, going. And then um, also I heard a great talk on the Swiss system and that system works because insurance companies there, they have insurance, it's regulated, very much regulated. It says what they can do and what they can't do. And it's through regulation that they're able to do it. Um, I work for a, a week each uh, month in an emergency room in an, on an Indian reservation. And the sentiment of the, of the Navajo people is that if, if one of their relatives dies in the home, uh, they've, they've got to burn down the home. They've got to just get rid of it. And so th they've got to do everything they can to keep this relative alive. That uh, at, it includes hospitalization. They absolutely don't want them at the end of life in their home. Now, I realize that uh, uh, a Dr. Kevorkian uh, approach or, quote, the, the death panels creates a lot of emotion, but we spend so much money on futile end-of-life care. And at the same time, we have to recognize how terrible, terrible it would be if we couldn't die, if all we could do is age but could not die. What is being done, uh, or do you see approach in 
kind of educating the American public to let our elderly die. Well, first, uh, excellent that, question. That, have, that, have end of, that are at the end of life, when, when care is, is recognized as futile. This is such a huge percentage of the money we spend. Okay, thank you. Oh, well, uh, I'll, I'll make a comment, and I'm sure Steve has comments too on this one. You know, uh, again, so much is cultural. Uh, the Navajo uh, tribe, you're exactly right, and I'm aware of that for the Navajos. And, but, you know, the culture with many other people is to have uh, a death that is acceptable within the home. Uh, I'll just share with you a, a quick story, um, uh, and that's of my mother. Uh, so my mom developed uh, stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma metastatic. Uh, my mom uh, wanted to have as much done as was reasonable until a point in time when she recognized that it was going to be futile. Uh, I was an advocate for her, but not her physician. Um, and that day came for my mom. Uh, we moved her into my house. Uh, my wife did a marvelous job along with other family members and myself in caring for her. And she had the type of death that she wanted. Uh, she was surrounded by people who loved her. Uh, she was dry, she was warm. We helped her with as much pain and anxiety as is possible. And my mom had a great passing. I personally want that kind of death too. Now, if I get in a car accident driving back I-15 to the Salt Lake City Airport to fly back to Boise tonight, I want the greatest health care that Salt Lake City can uh, provide, or Ogden, depending on where I get hurt. Uh, but I'll tell you, if I develop metastatic stage 4 non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that's refractory to chemotherapy or, or pancreatic cancer metastatic like my father died from, I want to be dry and I want to be warm, and I do not want to be in an ICU with buzzers, beepers, and bells, and people who don't know me partially clad. I do not want that kind of death. And so to educate the communities, there are quite a few things that are happening. Uh, I'll just mention a short, quick story and an example. The Gunderson Clinic in Wisconsin, and out of the city of La Crosse, has put together a marvelous community effort where it has taken the end-of-life discussion is taken off the back of the physicians in the, in the community. And they've employed a tremendously well-educated lay public made up of educators, nurses, parish priests, um, teachers that have been trained as advanced care planners to go into the community, talk with people, and help have an ongoing dialogue with them at three stages in their life, early step planning, middle step once chronic diseases and uh, life uh, uh, changing diseases occur, and then late step planning in terms of how then the end starts to look. Because of that, they have 99% of the community understanding what it is that they want and then advanced directives so designated so that the community's culture as opposed to the Navajo culture is for an understanding of the type of death and the type of choices that people want. This is about how you want to live, not necessarily how you want to die. And a lot of us, I think, do want that type of dignified death. I know in my personal practice, Brian, I'm sure, is probably can uh, speak to that as well. Oftentimes, I'm too busy to really sit down and have the types of conversations. I try to insert them. I think the model needs to change, but I think that's the direction we should try to do for the good of all of our communities, quite frankly. As we uh, end our time, we again want to thank our sponsors, the Ogden Clinic, the National Kidney Foundation, and UAFP. One more question. Sorry, Rhonda. <laughs> Last question. Go ahead, please. I do have a question in regards, you talked earlier about uh, basic right to health care and then individual wants, and I, I guess my biggest question is, especially when you were going uh, amongst Congress and all these delegates, is at what point did the balance, I guess, of trying to provide health care for everybody trump an individual's right to choose? And, and I refer specifically to the individual mandate, where we're saying we want the best for the good of the nation, but at the same time, that that 
limits individual choice in regards to does a person want or can't afford health insurance? Yeah, that's it's a great question, and that's why I went to the Supreme Court. Um, let me just share two, th two thoughts. First, every single nation outside the United States has an individual mandate. There is no existing industrialized country that does not require their citizens to have some sort of health insurance. So we're alone with that. Um, but it speaks to, and my second point, the American psyche again. Uh, we were founded as a, as a country of rugged individualists. It's what in many ways have made America great. Many of the people that moved to my state of Idaho and your state of Utah were pioneers. And the pioneer spirit is to not be told what to do, uh, is to figure out life through their lens and not necessarily a, a greater societal lens. So I think part of this is just America trying to figure out who we are, too, in terms of that. So you're exactly right. It is a fundamental question is, does individual choice trump societal good? And we still struggle with that. The Supreme Court decided, at least, and I'm not saying they were right or the wrong, but they did decide that at least that the individual mandate was constitutional. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we'll move out of the uh, luncheon room now. Ted will be signing books at the Uni University of Utah uh, book selling store right outside. Thank you to both our speakers.